Hi, my name is Drew. I work for the Environmental Volunteers. And in this video, we're going to be talking about king tides, what they are, how they work, and how they affect the ecology of the salt marsh. Now first, a little bit about who we are. So the Environmental Volunteers were founded in 1972, and we seek to provide nature science education to kids throughout the Bay Area. We do so with the help of our staff and our volunteers, and we always have volunteering opportunities available. So if you are interested in learning about how to become involved with us, please check out our website whenever you can. Now, our first kind of question to begin us off, what are the king tides? And I actually want you to think about this question for a second. Do you know what a king tide is? Have you ever heard that name before? What does the word king tide make you think of? I'll give you a second to think. Now what the king tides actually are, are just the highest tides of the year. So even higher than a normal high tide that you get twice a day, the king tides are the highest ones that you're going to get in any specific location. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. I've got a lot of cool pictures that show you some king tides and what they look like. But first to start us off, I wanna give us a little context. I want us to kind of understand what to compare the king tides to. So in this picture, I have a picture of the um, Baylands Nature Preserve. This is in Palo Alto. This is a salt marsh ecosystem, and this is where you get the tides coming in and out every day. This is right along the San Francisco Bay. Um, however, this is not during a king tide. This is just during a normal day, normal tides. Um, what you can see in this picture, you have to the right, you have the salt marsh. This is where the tides come in and out of. You have the Bay Trail right in the center here, which kind of takes you, takes you along the salt marsh. Um, and then you have some, a little um, up in here in what we call the high marsh, you have some of the larger plants, some of the shrubs, some of the trees, etc. And that's a little up away from the, up, up away from the marsh where all the tides are coming in and out of. And also one more thing to point out um, in this picture, you actually have this white building here. Um, that is our main office, our nature interpretive center. We call it the eco center. You're able to come out to the Baylands Nature Preserve and visit us at our um, interpretive center. It's a great place to visit. Now here's another picture. Um, again, this is the same, same place, Baylands Nature Preserve. Um, you can kind of see more of the marsh in this picture. You have the channels which run through it. That's bringing water. Again, this is not during king tides though. However, the tide is fairly high. Then you have all the marsh plants. A lot of this is cord grass, which we'll talk about later. Here's another picture. This is actually taken of right down at the, um, at the salt marsh, and this is during low tide. So all that water that you saw previously in the channels, that water goes back out into the bay. And this is what's revealed. This is all the mud that lies at the bottom of those channels. This is what you get to see during the low tide. Now this is another picture of high tide. We're still not at the, the king tides yet, um, but this is the same sort of channel. It's just now, as opposed to low tide where you could see the mud, all the water comes back in. It fills up all those channels and it comes up right up to all these plants in the salt marsh. And also in this picture, we actually have our, um, it's a great egret down in the left. But again, this is just showing you kind of what a normal high tide looks like. Now, this is our first picture of an actual king tide. And I wanna give you a moment. I want you to look at this picture and see what you notice. Maybe think about what some of the differences are to some of the other pictures we looked at. You can pause the video if you want more time to look. Now, some of the key differences here, 
you can see that actually the Bay Trail, which I talked about in our first picture, that trail has actually become flooded. And that does happen during especially high king tides, the highest ones of the year. Um, you'll get the water that actually makes it all the way up onto the trails. You might be able to see there's actually a line of sandbags, which is normally to hold back the tides, but during a king tide, even that's not enough. It'll just come up onto the walkways. And if you're trying to walk on those trails, hopefully you have some, some proper boots to make it through those. Another thing is, if we look at the, off to the right here, a lot of the salt marsh is kind of covered up. It's completely saturated with water. So whereas normally, you'd be able to see most of the plants with some channels, the entire area is flooded. One last thing that is worth pointing out is the weather on this particular day. It is very overcast. Um, this was actually taken during um, a November king tide. And we'll talk about when the king tides happen and why they happen in our winter months as opposed to another month. But um, it is an overcast day. And sometimes you'll get other conditions affecting how high the king tides gets, including whether it's rainy on the day or not. However, most of the effects of this are due to the tides itself, just the king tides coming in. Here's another picture. This kind of gets a little closer to the ground and you can see just how much the trail is flooded. Here's some more pictures of some king tide events. This was on a clearer day. It wasn't as overcast. However, you can still see that the entire salt marsh here has become flooded and the water still made its way up onto the trails. In fact, this was a little after the highest point when the water had started receding some. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the, of the salt marsh. So on the left, you have the kind of normal channels during high tide. On the right, you can see this whole area has become flooded and those channels are a lot more than channels now. In fact, it's only the tips of the plants that are able to kind of stay above the water. And then just one last thing, this is a video that actually shows you the tides coming in during a king tide event. And what you can see here, this little line of um, this little line of plants here off to the right. This is normally when the, where the water would stop. It wouldn't come up past this. Usually be a fair amount below it, but we'll watch the video. And you can see just how much the water is coming in, just covering the entirety of the marsh. Watch it one more time. Covering the entirety of the marsh and flooding it essentially. And this is not what you would get during a high tide. This is very much a king tide phenomenon. Now for our kind of next section here, um, how do the tides work? And again, um, another question I want you to think about it. Do you know how the tides work or what causes the tides? Kind of first, we'll take a look at what the tides actually look like. So I talked a lot earlier about low tide and high tide. You might be familiar with those terms or you might not, and that's okay. If you're not familiar, what actually happens on coastal areas is the water from the ocean will come in and out every day. And there will be a point where the water of the ocean is highest and a point where it'll be lowest. Um, and we're gonna take a look at this video here. This video is kind of going to show us tides coming in and out. This video was a time lapse over the period of a day. It's over a considerable period of hours. So this is not happening all at once. The tides don't come in and wash everything in a couple minutes. It does take hours and hours. It's a very gradual process. But what you can see in this video, you can see that the water coming in and it eventually slowly covers the area, it floods it. And this is the high tide right here. However, the tides don't stay like that. They'll eventually start flowing out again. The water will flow out back into the ocean. And this area won't be saturated with water anymore. It won't be covered. This is during low tide. And we have a picture of the kind of two side by side. We have the low tide on the left. Not very much water in this picture. And then we have the high tide on the right. 
Now, kind of back to our question, what causes the tides? So if you thought about that for a second and you remembered that, or guessed maybe that it was um, the moon that actually causes the tides, that it actually is what happens. So it is the moon that causes the tides. Um, to be more specific, it's actually the gravity of the moon. And in this diagram here, you can kind of see we have the earth here in the center, we have the moon. This darker blue oval represents the tides. And this red arrow here, this is representing the gravitational pull of the moon. So every object has gravity associated with it. And the, the planets and moons of our solar system, they have a lot of gravity because they're huge, they're massive. Um, and what you inevitably get with that is you get a pull from that gravity. The gravity of the Earth helps us keep down, helps us keep from floating away or something if there wasn't any gravity. The gravity of the moon, um, or sorry, let me, let me back up. The gravity of the Earth also keeps the moon orbiting it. The moon kind of wrote, goes in a circle around the Earth, and it's the gravity of the Earth that's holding the moon in place. However, it's not just the Earth that acts upon the moon. The moon acts upon the Earth a little bit. And that's kind of what this red arrow is showing. The moon has its own gravity and it's always pulling on the earth as well. And you can see how that's affecting the tides. So when the moon's traveling around, the tides are going to kind of follow it. They're going to be pulled towards the moon. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Does that seem possible to you? If the moon is pulling upon the tides like that enough to give us um, to where the water comes in and out like that every day. Why don't we feel the pull of the moon? And the answer to that, why we don't feel the pull of the moon, is simply because the gravity of the Earth is just a lot stronger. The gravity of the Earth is going to hold us in place. However, because of the dynamics of the water, the way it works, the, the moon is actually able to affect the water in some way, even if it's not able to affect us in any way that we notice. Now, there are a couple more forces here, which I'll talk briefly on. Um, this is also answering the question some of you might have, why is the tides an oval? So not only is there the gravity of the moon, there's also a force called inertia. Some of you might be familiar with this term, some of you might not. Inertia is a law of physics, something that we notice in the universe, where an object in motion actually tends to want to stay in motion. So if something's moving, it's going to keep moving unless it's stopped by something. And that is what we call inertia. And then actually the same thing happens with the tides. So you'll see that the gravity of the moon is pulling the tides off to the direction of the moon. However, when the water is traveling along the earth, the direction that the water is traveling in creates some inertia. It's moving in a certain direction. And once we get to the opposite side here, it's actually going to move a little bit more. And then we also have these green arrows. So the green arrows are showing that the earth's gravity. And this is kind of what's creating the oval. Whereas you have the gravity of the moon off to the right, you have the inertia off to the left on the kind of top and bottom here, you have the earth's gravity holding the tides in. So that's pulling the tides in and keeping it kind of compact. So those are kind of all the forces that work here, all the forces that affect the tides. Now, why are the tides at different times? So for those who don't know, um, if you want to say visit the Baylands or something like that, that place where you can see the tides, the tide, the time of um, high tide and the time of low tide is actually going to be different every single day. And that is because there's a tidal cycle that doesn't match up with our day. Whereas our day is 24 hours, the tidal cycle is 12 hours and 25 minutes. So, and in the kind of, um, in a day you get two tidal cycles and that actually ends at 24 hours and 50 minutes. So a little longer than a day. Um, and because of that, because it takes a little longer than our day 
um, you actually get the tides at different times. Now, for as to why that is, as to why it works that way, why the tidal cycle is 24 hours and 50 minutes, it is again because of the moon. And it's because the moon actually doesn't make its way around the earth in 24 hours, just like our earth moves around, um, our earth rotates in 24 hours. The moon actually makes its way around the earth in 24 hours and 50 minutes. So it takes that additional 50 minutes for the moon to kind of catch up to where it was the day before. And because of that, your tides are going to be different at different times every day. Now, this is where we start talking about the king tides. That kind of all of what we've talked about before, that's normal tides, that are just your average like low tide, high tide every day. King tides on the other hand, um, or sometimes called spring tides, um, this has a couple more forces at work here, or specifically one source or one force, and that's the sun's gravity. So what you can see in this picture here is you have the earth, you have the moon, that's that gray circle in the middle, and you can see the gravity of the moon pulling on the tides, but you also have the sun. And what happens when the sun lines up with the moon like this is the gravity of the sun and the gravity of the moon actually add together. They add together to create a stronger pull than you would get normally. And because of that, you get the highest tide you can get. You have both of those forces acting on each other, both of those forces pulling the tides, and you get a higher tide because of that. Now, again, the moon does not necessarily need to be between the sun. Um, if you have the moon off to the other side, you'll still have two forces adding together. Um, you just have the sun's gravity and the inertia. You remember the inertia we talked about earlier, the tides, how they, when they make their way all around the earth, they kind of want to stay moving. Um, those two forces act together. So even if the moon's up here, you might get tides on the other side, other side of the planet. Now, um, this, what this diagram is showing us is called a neap tide. So neap tides are different from the king tides. Um, in fact, they are the exact opposite. So whereas king tides are the highest tides of the year, neap tides are the lowest day or the lowest tides of the year. And this happens seven days after a king tide event or spring tide event. Um, and what is going on is you have the moon and the sun forming a 90 degree angle. They're like this. And what you get is the moon is pulling in one direction, but the sun is pulling in the other. So these forces are not adding together. In fact, they're kind of um, balancing each other out, canceling each other out. Um, and because of this, you'll get the lowest tides that you can get. Now, as our final thing to talk about, this has to do with the season that you get king tides. And um, like I mentioned before, the king tides are sometimes called spring tides, um, but that has nothing to do with when we get king tides. The name spring tides just refers to the fact that the tides are kind of springing forth. Um, the season where you get king tides is actually kind of December and January. That's typically when you'll see, or that is when you'll see the king tides, sometimes a little in November too, but it is mostly December and January. You'll have a couple king tides in those months, a um, couple days of king tides in each month. And this diagram right here, this is kind of showing us why. So if you haven't already, look more closely at the king tides. See if you notice what's going on here. Give you a second. So if you were able to figure it out, what's actually happening is the Earth has an orbit around the sun. It travels around the sun. And that's kind of how we get our years, how we get our season. One year is a full orbit of the Earth around the sun. And the Earth's orbit is actually not a perfect circle. It's a little offset a little bit. And we call that an elliptical orbit. It's not a super, it's not super crazy. In fact, this, this diagram isn't to scale. So um, however, that what it does mean is that there is a point where the Earth is actually closer to the sun 
or closest to the sun that it's going to get, and a point where the Earth is actually farthest away from the sun. So during the January and December time frame, that's actually when the Earth is closest to the sun. And during July and the summer months, um, or summer months for us in the Northern Hemisphere at least, that is when the Earth is actually farthest away from the sun. Now, for those of us, um, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, and um, you might be thinking, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. Why is the Earth the closest to the sun during our winter months? And the reason for that is actually because the, um, the proximity to the sun, how close the Earth is to the sun, is not the deciding um, factor on how we get our seasons. What decides our seasons is actually um, the tilt of the earth. For those of you who don't know, um, the earth is actually um, tilted a little bit. It's not perfectly straight up. The earth is tilted. And what you'll get is when the earth is traveling around the sun, um, that tilt will cause one half of the earth to be facing the sun and one half to be kind of facing away from the sun. And that is actually why we get different seasons in different hemispheres. So the Southern hemisphere or the um, bottom of the earth, if you will, is the one that will actually face towards the sun during January and December. And the bottom hemisphere or the bottom of the earth, this is actually their summer months. However, in the Northern hemisphere or the top of the earth, um, we are facing away from the sun during January and December. So, um, and because of that, it's actually colder. There's less sun hitting us there on the Northern hemisphere. Um, now, that explains the seasons. Again, the summer um, for the Southern Hemisphere happens um, when they are when it's closest to the Earth. However, when it makes it all the way around, um, the Northern Hemisphere is going to be facing towards the sun. And in July, um, June, August, that's when the Northern Hemisphere gets its summer. But as to what causes the king tides, um, the king tides are caused by the proximity because the closer the earth is to the sun, the more gravity will be acting upon it. So what happens is that additional gravity, again, it's, it's all working towards creating your, your um, largest tide of the year, your king tide. Now, as kind of our last sort of talking point, we're going to talk a little bit about tidal ecology. And um, what we mean by tidal ecology is essentially how the tides and how the king tides, and maybe in particular, how they affect the plants of the, um, of the area that the tides come in and out of. Now, what I want us all to do is think about what plants need to survive. And I'll ask this as a question, maybe, um, give yourself a moment to think about what a plant needs to live. Now, there are a couple things. Um, water and soil are very important. Um, two more things that a plant needs to survive. They need sunlight and air. Um, but those are the things that plants need to survive. And the water and soil is what we're going to be taking a look at these in these tidal areas. I want you to think about, is there usable water and soil in the baylands? So that baylands nature preserve we were talking about, um, the area where you get the king tides coming out, in and out of, is there water and soil there that the plants would be able to use? And now that you've thought about that for a little bit, um, yes, indeed, there is water and soil for them to use. In fact, again, in those pictures that we looked at, there were quite a lot of plants there. So obviously they have to be making use of the water and soil. Um, however, the thing to consider is the nature of that water. So 
For those who have been to the ocean and maybe have had the unfortunate experience of drinking ocean water, the ocean is very salty, it has a lot of salt in it, and plants don't necessarily like that salt. So what you get is, yes, well, they can use the soil and they can use the water. You have a lot of salt in both of those. So the plants in these tidal areas, they have to be um, adapted or able to handle um, that amount of salt in the water and soil. So what you get kind of again, what challenges do these plants face in these tidal areas? They face the challenge of there being a lot of salt here. Um, and what happens is you'll get kind of a noticeable difference in zones of the tidal marsh. We have two zones here, um, one of which we call the low marsh. And this is the area that gets the most, um, kind of the most water coming in and out of. This is the area which the tides come in and out of. These plants are getting that water coming right up to them every day. And in the case of king tides, even covering them completely. And then we have the high marsh, which is kind of up away from the low marsh here. It doesn't get water coming right up to it or covering it. Um, and because of that, there will be less salt up here in the high marsh. Now there will still be some salt. Um, the water that's coming in and out has salt in it and that will get into the soil, but there will be less than the low marsh. And because of that, you actually get different plants. Now, one of the plants, one of the specific plants, this is a low marsh plant, and this is the cord grass. If we remember back to some of the earlier pictures, I'll show us um, in this picture here. This is mostly cord grass that we're looking at. It's a very common plant at the Baylands Nature Preserve and throughout tidal areas in California. Um, now, like we were talking about, Cord grass, because it's a low marsh plant, because it um, lives right where the tides are coming in and out of, it has to be able to handle the salt. It has to have some way of dealing with it. It doesn't necessarily want to have all that salt inside of it. So our question is, how is cord grass adapted to get clean water? Now this is an interesting um, picture. I want you to take a look at it, see what you see, <laughs> see what you notice in this picture. And if you'll notice, it has some white spots on the leaves. What do you think these spots are? Now, I'm sure you have plenty of guesses, but as to what these spots actually are, um, these are actually salt crystals. So if you've ever seen, maybe looked at salt that you've poured or something like that, it actually comes in little crystals, um, little grains like this. And you get them all over the cord grass leaves. Now, if you've ever, um, if you've ever like taken a glass of ocean water or something or seen it, um, you'll notice that the crystals don't really float around in the ocean. So it's not the, it's not the um, tidal water that's leaving these salt crystals on the leaves here. These crystals are coming from somewhere else. And what's actually happening, what's so interesting about cord grass is cord grass is making these crystals. What it's actually doing is it's taking all the salt that um, comes into its body through the water it drinks, um, and all of that salt that's in that water, what it does is it actually pushes it out of itself. It pushes them out almost like we would sweat. Um, instead of sweating water, what the cord grass does is it sweats salt crystals. And you'll actually be able to see if you go to the Bay Lands or an area with cord grass, you might actually see a cord grass leaf with these salt crystals on it. And that is because that's the way that um, cord grass has adapted to deal with the salt. It actually sweats it out. It pushes it out of its body. Now there's another cool thing about cord grass, another adaptation it has to the tides. Um, if we take a look, this, um, this is a cross section. So it's a, a stem of a cord grass that's been cut in half. And the center of it is actually hollow. 
I want you to take a moment and think about why the stem might be hollow and why it would want a hollow stem in um, a tidal area, in tidal ecology. Now there's a couple different things that you might have thought of. However, what the cordgrass is doing is um, it's actually, this is a way for it to circulate air throughout the stem, throughout the plant. Um, and like we talked about, um, air is another one of the things that plants need to survive. Um, air is um, used, it, um, for those who want to get technical, um, it's the carbon dioxide that's used in photosynthesis. Um, the air plant takes in the air, takes the carbon dioxide, and um, it'll actually give off oxygen as part of that. But the basics of it essentially is that plants need to breathe, they need air. And this hollow stem, it actually helps air circulate through the plant, circulate through the stem. And what's important about that for the cordgrass is it helps the air travel up and down the plant, even if the plant can't get um, air through all parts of its body. Um, where this becomes important is especially during king tides when the water covers the cordgrass, except for the very tip, if the cordgrass didn't have this hollow stem, it wouldn't be able to circulate air from the very tip all the way down to the bottom as well. However, because it does have a hollow stem, it can take the air from the top and bring it down to the bottom immediately. So the entire plant can get air even when most of the plant is underwater. If you wanna think about an analogy for it, it's like a snorkel. If you've ever used a snorkel or seen what a snorkel does, it's basically a tube that we use to put in our mouth so that we can breathe underwater. The tube um, goes um, above the surface of the water and then we can take in air from the top of the tube and the tube is hollow so that it can come into our mouth and we can breathe while we're underwater. It's the same thing for cord grass. Now, um, another plant that we have is pickleweed. And it does have a little bit of a funny name. It is kind of named that because they, um, they look like little tiny pickles. Um, and pickleweed is another um, salt marsh plant. It lives in the low marsh, just like the cordgrass. And it has, to weigh, it has to have a way of dealing with that salt as well. It has to have an adaptation for that salt. What happens with pickleweed, um, is actually visible in this picture here. So we can see in this picture that this, whereas in the previous picture, this pickleweed is green, that is its primary color. This one is red. What the red is actually showing you is essentially the way that pickleweed deals with the salt. And it doesn't, it doesn't deal with the salt by becoming red. The color doesn't help it. Um, however, what the pickleweed is doing is it takes the salt, like the cordgrass does, it kind of separates it, but instead of pushing it out of its body, um, it pushes it into a specific part of its body. Um, so it'll kind of decide that maybe one branch of the pickleweed, one um, stem with a couple of shoots coming off of it is going to hold all the salt for the plant. So all the salt is going to be pushed into that specific part. And as more salt gets pushed into that area, that area will actually turn red you'll see a noticeable color change. And that is because that section of the pickleweed has all the salt collected in it. Now the salt is not healthy for the plant, um, but because it's in a specific area, the plant can kind of um, continue normally in most parts of its body. However, the part with all the salt in it, eventually once that has too much salt in it, it will fall off. It'll just come off and the pickleweed can grow a new stem there grow new um, shoots, new leaves, et cetera. And again, um, as it draws in more salt, it can keep sort of cycling that process. The salt goes into a specific area of the body until there's too much salt there, it falls off, it um, regrows that part. And um, again, just keeps pushing the salt there and it's, it's a cycle. It's the way that pickleweed deals with it. It doesn't push it out of its body like the cordgrass, grass, 
but it kind of reserves a section to eventually eventually fall off and then a new salt free um, stem can grow in its place. Now, um, as sort of our last kind of thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about roots. So I want you to think about for a second, how might the roots help a plant in the baylands? What are some of the ways that roots can help it survive, especially in the area where you have all that salt water? And an area where you have the tides coming in and out, washing over the plants every single day. Now, one plant I like to bring up as an example of this is um, called the Salty Susan, um, has a little funny name, but um, Salty Susan is another low marsh plant, um, just like the other two. And um, the roots are actually the adaptation that the Salty Susan has to deal with the salt. So unlike the other two plants where they had kind of, um, uh, or they had very specific ways of dealing it with it. The way that Salty Susan deals with it is it actually can filter the salt um, out through its roots. So when the water is, when the plant is taking up water through its roots, the roots are um, advanced, if you will, enough to um, filter out the salt. They'll kind of say, no, I don't want the salt. They'll close it off to the salt, but the water will be able to get through. And then the water, free of most of the salt, will be able to travel up through the plant. So the roots can kind of filter it out. And um, that's a cool adaptation that this specific plant has. In addition to that, and this is something that's important for all of the low marsh plants, so um, Salty Susan, but also cordgrass and pickleweed, is um, when you get a lot of the plants kind of growing together like this in a, um, in a field, if you will, all of the roots um, kind of intertwine with each other. They actually kind of hold on like this. They form little knots. Um, they grow around each other. They form, um, yeah, like I said, they form knots and they hold the plants in place. And why this is important, because if we think back to the tides and the king tides with the water coming in and out every day, um, if a plant wasn't able to hold itself into the ground, that tides might actually wash the plant out. And these are not ocean plants. They don't want to be living um, in the ocean. They don't want to be floating in the water. They want to stay in that soil. They need that soil to survive. So what they do instead of just growing alone is they all grow together, their roots, roots lock together and they perform kind of a, um, or they create a very strong, um, very strong net, if you will, that holds them in place. It holds them into the soil. It keeps them from being washed out by the tides. Now, um, sort of as our last topic for this video, um, and this again has to do with king tides, what does this mean for climate change? So, why we like to think about the king tides in terms of climate change is because king tides can actually sort of give us a glimpse into the future. So there's a lot of things that come with climate change, um, a lot of different things that happen all over the world. However, the one specific thing that we talk about here is sea level rise. So um, as more as the glaciers are melting, um, as more water is being added to the ocean, um, you'll actually have the sea levels rising. Again, there's just, there's just more water there. And because of this, because you have more water in the ocean, your tides are going to get higher. So if we look in this picture here, this was a king tide event during 2014 in um, Marin. Um, what you can actually see here is again, kind of like what we were looking at, the, um, the king tides water, this highest tide of the year, it's actually covering this little bike path here in the areas that we've developed that are right up close to the water. Um, in the event of a high tide, that water can come up to these areas and flood them. 
Now, again, back to sea level rise and, and climate change, as the sea keeps rising, um, king tide events like this are not going to be just a once a year or once um, for a couple of days every year thing. The high tides of every day are actually going to become the king tides of, of now, if you will. So as the as the high tides come in, they're just going to be flooding these areas every single day. They're going to flood the trails at the Baylands. They're going to flood this bike path here in Marin. We have another picture here. Um, this is actually San Francisco in 2016. Um, the water here actually almost comes all the way up to the street. And again, this is a king tide. This is a very unusual occurrence. Happens only um, a couple days per year, but in the future, with rising sea levels, um, with climate change, what you'll get is this is going to become an everyday thing. The, um, the high tides are going to come all the way up. They could start flooding our roads. And as kind of the last thing, that's sort of that's sort of what might happen to our cities, our developed areas. Um, but if we also think about what's going to happen to the plants in the salt marsh. Um, step us back to here. Um, so if you remember, um, the low marsh, all those plants that we were talking about earlier, um, those are the ones with all the adaptations to salt. So they're probably not going to be crazy happy, super excited about having the high tides just flooding them every single day, but they do have ways to survive. They have ways to deal with that. The high marsh, they do not, the high marsh up here does not want all that salt. So all the trees and all the shrubs that you get in the high marsh, that's going to be pushed farther back. That's not going to be able to grow where in those flooded areas, in the areas where the high tides are covering them every single day. And also for the low marsh, if these plants are getting completely covered by water every single day, they're not gonna be able to grow there either. So what you're going to get is you're going to get a loss of habitat. You're going to get the low marsh being pushed back, the high marsh being pushed back, and you're going to just get less marsh in general. There's going to be less room for it to grow because it's having to grow further and further away from the, um, the tides there. And it is eventually going to start pushing into our developed areas, into our cities, into the areas where it can't grow. So that's kind of why it's important to talk about the king tides, why it's important to learn about them. Again, it shows you what climate change um, can do, what rising sea levels can do. It might help us plan maybe in ways how we might um, be able to help the salt marsh or um, ways that we can prevent it from flooding the roads, flooding the trails, flooding the bike paths. If you do want more information about king tides, I do recommend this a resource, the California King Tides Project. It's um, put on by the Coastal Commission and they have a lot of pictures and additional information about King Tides in general. Um, I want to thank you for watching this video for your interest in King Tides. I hope you learned a lot. Um, I do sincerely hope that you're actually able to make it out and see the King Tides in person and at some point. Again, the Baylands Nature Preserve in Palo Alto is a great place to do so, but you get tides throughout the coast and there's a lot of areas, other areas where you can see king tides. Um, again, my name was Drew. I worked for the Environmental Volunteers. Um, I hope this was um, educational. I hope you learned a lot. If you're interested in learning more about the organization, perhaps volunteering to do um, some of the programs, other educational programs that we um, engage kids and um, the public with, then um, please check us out at our website. Thank you.